Hello and welcome to Pathways, where you were invited to join me for a visit with leaders in personal development and cultural evolution. This is your host, Paul O'Brien. 23 centuries ago, in a marketplace in Athens, a character named Zeno, the founder of Stoicism, built his philosophy on powerful ideas that still resonate today. Ideas like all human beings can become citizens of the world, regardless of their nationality, gender, or social class. Ideas like happiness comes from living in harmony with nature. And most importantly, humans always have the freedom to choose their attitude, even when they cannot control external circumstances. And how timely is that? Our guest today is Kai Whiting, author of the book, Being Better, Stoicism for a World Worth Living In. Kai is a lecturer and researcher in environmental sustainability and stoicism at UC Louvain in Belgium. To relax, he likes to build Legos, watching, enjoys watching the kids program Lego Ninjago in multiple languages and reading Robert Muchamor's Cherub series in Portuguese. His favorite music bands are Duran Duran and Soda Stereo, both of whom were famous before he was born. If money were no object, Kai would plant enough trees to tackle climate breakdown, rescue foxes and red pandas and buy the NFL's Jacksonville Jaguars, his favorite NFL team. Hello, Kai, and welcome to Pathways. Hi, Paul. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to this. As we had a chat earlier, you've you've just uh, piqued my interest. So I'm really, I'm really keen to see what kind of questions you can ask me. I hope I don't trip over too many of them. Well, it's a pleasure to have you on the show, and I really enjoyed your book. Um, it taught me a lot about Stoicism and the history of Stoicism which I didn't really know uh, very much about. And, and I'm wondering, how did you become interested in Stoicism? And is this considered a department of philosophy? So that's a really good, good question. I came into contact with Stoicism because I happened to be reading a book that was influenced by Stoicism. But it really made an impact, not because the book was absolutely amazing, though I really did enjoy it, but because of the circumstances around reading it. So I was reading it. Uh, when I received a call to say that my grandmother, well, my nan, was, was unwell. And I took it with me and I sat in the hospital waiting room and I was really hopeful that she would make it, that she would live. I honestly believed that. I thought, yeah, she's always been strong. She hasn't been ill since she was a child. She'll be fine. And she wasn't. And when we got the news, it was like the oxygen got sucked out of the room and everybody's face kind of fell and was contorted with pain. And had just read that there's a difference between observation and perception, fact and feeling. The fact was that she had died. And sometimes you think, well, why did she die? The answer is easy, because she was ill. That's why she died. The harder question is, what do I do about it? And I suddenly realized through stoicism, straight philosophy, that the fact that she died doesn't tell me what I have to do. It just tell me, tells me that someone is no longer living. So the key question for me was not why did she die? Because the answer was because she was ill. But what was I going to do about it? What, who, I, who was I going to become? And so she had a saying that she said, whatever you do, aim high, because if you fall, you fall in the middle. So I was like, well, that's really good. That's great. And my granddad had the, had the saying, like, give it your best shot. I was like, well, what does that mean? What does my best shot look like? And well, how, how high shall I aim? And if I fall, how do I know I'm in the middle? And so Stoicism gave, kind of gave me the next few steps because I really didn't know what to do. She wasn't one of those grandmas that you tuck away, Paul. She was a grandma that was very sort of integral to the family and we'd lost our leader and it was very disruptive. So I was thinking, if Stoicism can help me with this, what else can Stoicism do? So I decided to use my environmental knowledge to work out, can Stoicism help us with collective problems or is it only useful for like, if somebody dies or if we're ill or if we're having a difficult time because we've lost our job what what can stoicism do for us on the collective front and that was the challenge that i kind of the goal that i threw down in my in my quest to aim high and fall somewhere in the middle uh-huh wow so then you became a lecturer on stoicism um did you have like professorial credentials 
Um, do you have those? Are, are you so yeah, for the I, well, my credentials, my PhD is sustainable energy. I see. And I had a lot of the environmental background. And for the stroke background, I basically I was mentored by the call for Leonidas and A.A. Long, who's based at Berkeley, and Professor Chris Gill, who's based at Exeter. So I had a very traditional stoic kind of way of, way of being taught because people say, well, you don't have a PhD. And I'm like, nor did Seneca. So it's kind of like I literally just sat and was like, tell me, I have questions, they'd give me the answer. They'd say, well, they'd give, normally give me another question. That's typically how you do the answer. And why do you think that? And just sat down for hours out weeks years now just listening to people who knew more about me more than i did about the subject and then in return they would say oh, okay tell us about climate breakdown because we also think the stories can, can be used for these kind of matters but we don't have that background you have the academic background so it was kind of like it was an uneven swap i think they gave me more than i did if them but it was a very sort of traditional sort of uh, teaching and learning process well, now you're becoming an expert on stoicism. I mean, you have a book, right? That's like <laughs> the best credential ever. And uh, so anyway, I want to ask you, one of the reviewers of your book uh, described stoicism as the go-to philosophy for our times. Why, why did he say that? I think particularly actually uh, during, that was written during the pandemic. And I think the pandemic has sort of, confuse a lot of people what they thought was important has no longer is no longer important what they ignored has become important what they thought was a stable you know stable reality like i always have my job i will always work nine till five i know that not everybody had that and a lot of younger people didn't but a lot of older people did and suddenly they were you know forced to work from home and they didn't know what that meant and they still don't know if they will ever go back to the office a lot of people thought their kids would always go to school and they wouldn't be at home and they wouldn't have to teach them. And now they're finding, you know, disruption like, oh, but I work full time. Oh, but my kids are here. Oh, how do I fix that? What do I do with that? What about my emotional support? Oh, you, I used to take them to my grandma or to my mum, but they're older and they're vulnerable and I can't take them anymore because I might, you know, harm them in some way. So I think people's worlds were literally turned upside down. Mine wasn't actually. Because I've been working from, you know, home or in the office quite independently for a few years, so my my world didn't really change. And I think academics basically use their body to carry their brain from one room in one room to another room. So I didn't I didn't really like it. wasn't like my life was very much disrupted. But I did see other people's lives become extremely disrupt, uh, disrupted. Even if they, for example, they like going to the gym a lot, and they say, well, their their identity is being strong. They couldn't go to the gym, or they saw their identity as being the captain of a football team they couldn't play football so i think that for a lot of people that stoicism can say things like okay it's what's going on outside is not in your control but what's going on between your ears is how do you feel about it why do you feel that way why do you have that attitude what is it that you can do today yesterday there's nothing you can do you can't change it tomorrow is not completely in your control some of it, you can influence it, but you, you can't grasp it in the same way that you can grasp the present. So what is it that you want to do right now? What's going to make it better for you? So I often say that stoicism doesn't give you answers, right? It just gives you a framework to ask better questions. And that's why in the, in the book, in chapter one, we said, Leo and I, the co-author, we can't give you the answers, Paul, because we don't know you and you know yourself better. And so all we can do is reframe the problem for you and you must come up with a solution because it was kind of like an anti-self-help book a little bit in that way because we felt like a lot of self-help books say do one two three you'll get abc that's not self-help it's the opposite <laughs> that's dependency that's like oh i must listen to everything that kai says and if i don't listen carefully enough i won't achieve that's literally the opposite of self-help right. so Leo and i was like no what is it that you need in your life what is it you need to put in place it's not that we want to put ourselves in your shoes because our feet don't fit your shoes. What we want to know is, what, are you happy in your shoes? And if you're not, how would you like to get new shoes? Or how would you like to walk around barefoot? Does that make sense, Paul? Yeah, it makes total sense. And I think, you know, we do a lot of shows here on Pathways, a lot of, have a lot of conversations about self-help and personal development. And, you know, I've read probably more books on self-help and personal development than anybody on earth as a result of hosting this show for over 30 years. And, you know, I think you're right. It's sort of like, 
every counselor, every therapist, every coach, every author, you know, is basically projecting, you know, what seemed to work for them as if it's a prescription for other people to follow. And your sort of uh, stoicism is, or what you just expressed is in contrast to that uh, because uh, it has respect for uh, individual uh, personalities, individual uh, sets of skills, individual situations. I'd like to ask you, Correct. you know, there was a thing in your book where they talked about the traditional stoic worldview. And I'm very interested in philosophy. And, and it said, this represents a complex mix of pantheism, the belief that nature is God, and theism, the belief in the existence of a supreme being or beings. And I found that fascinating because I've studied the history of religion and religious systems and belief systems. And, you know, I'm not a big fan on monotheism, but that's, uh, so talk to us, what, the, what is this mix of pantheism and theism and why do you have to put it that way? I mean, doesn't pantheism incorporate theism? It depends who you speak to, right? Because some people don't. It's kind of like, you know, when people say stay in your lane kind of thing. So, which is a very American expression, I must say. One of the, yes, one of the hallmarks of pathways is we refuse to stay in our lane. Well, that's, well, that's fantastic. That's probably why we get on, Paul. <laughs> because if you only stay in your lane, how do you learn anything, really, honestly? So the, the, Stoics, the Stoics do have a world, uh, an odd worldview because they are pan, pantheist in the sense that everything that is in in on earth or in the universe is god and we're all interconnected we'll whatever is this the whatever stuff there is all constitutes one there is a unity of the one but there is a sort of like the theism because it's not very biocentric so it's not like the earth per se is god because a lot of pamphlets say oh it's earth per se no no it's the essence it's it's the essence of, of this the matter for example god is the body right the physical but god also has a mind and it's that mind which is the essence of all the stuff in the universe. And it is that mind that is the divine spark of reason. So Epictetus will talk about God being like the playwright and God describing roles to us. So your role may be right now, your role is, you know, radio slash podcast host. And my role right now is to talk to you and to be interviewed by you. But I also have other roles, right? I might have a role as a son or a brother. And that for the Stoics is divinely, you know, divinely assigned to you, which is not a typical pantheistic kind of earth does its thing and, and it's, it's holy and it's sacred because it gives you life and sustains you. Stoics also believe that, but they do see that this divine spark actually drives you to want to be the round peg in the round hole. And when we decide as human beings to sort of... It, unalign ourselves from from god's will that's when we become the square peg we kind of become the dorian gray like every time we do something that is disrupts our character we become uglier and uglier and uglier and really stories of man god in well, god in general cause you always cause you back to a sense of virtue to come back to yourself to to hit the mark because to miss the mark is where the word sin comes from so the idea that every time we do something incorrectly we miss the mark and we become uglier as a result. So that's not typically a pantheistic sort of perspective because God is not normally imbued with a sort of um, anthropomorphic mind, as it were. And it's, it's kind really, of it's almost kind of mindless. Right. And and God, you know, I mean, the God that I was taught to believe in is very judgmental. <laughs> He's <laughs> keeping track of everything. And um, you know, I was taught to feel guilty about all kinds of things. But anyway, okay, moving on. In the book, uh, you make the statement, the power of stoicism lies in its unique view and what it means to be happy. That is to achieve eudaimonia. Let's talk about eudaimonia. Eudaimonia uh, for me, I, you can always tell where people are from, basically. There's no correct way of pronouncing it in English language. Okay. Is, a, is, a, is a perfect st state of being. And you either are there or you're not. In the same way, you're either right now in Oregon or you're not. If you're near Oregon, you're still not there. So when you become sort of that circular peg in that circular hole, you, your soul is complete, complete at one, completely in tune with the universe, with the playwright. And your, your soul, from the Stoics perspective, it's completely thickened. Because you, you want, in, from the Stoics perspective, virtue is the only good, and you want to be virtuous. 
it's not the idea that I must be virtuous because that's the good thing to do right now. It's like, actually, what I want to do is I want to create a character in myself that is incapable of, say, sinning rather than going, I, you know, I mustn't do this. That's the correct thing to do. It's like, no, how can I develop a character that is so at one with nature, so at one with God that I am unable to miss the mark, that I am unable to, to do what is incorrect. But God is your, as you just going back to your previous comment, God is not judgmental. You, your only sin is it where is the one that you do against yourself. God is not, God holds you to a standard in the sense of being aligned, that being in tune, kind of like I'm, I'm either playing with the orchestra or I'm not, right? Because it's not just that I do good things for me, but I do good things so the orchestra sounds good too. Because being a good trumpet player is all not just about blowing as hard as you can and being the best trumpet player you can be, but making everybody else sound good. So Marcus Aurelius, who was a Stoic and a Roman emperor, says, what's good for the beehive is good for the bee. So in Stoicism, when you do the right thing, it's right for everybody. Yeah, It's yeah, not I just right that. for you. Yeah, I, I think I've been a Stoic for a long time because I have often said to myself and others, nothing that is good for me can be harmful for anybody else. And vice, Correct. Vice versa. So, yeah. So now you talk about virtues and being virtuous, and this is kind of the emphasis, the practical emphasis of the Stoic life. Um, and you name four Stoic virtues. Can we just uh, touch on those? Yes. So to explain virtue, which is really doing what doing what doing what is what aligns you right with with nature. They said it, it's made manifest in the way of courage, justice, self control, and wisdom. But there is a unity. It's not like a commandment. It's not like be just right? It's more like, how can I like, again, how can I develop my character in such a way that I'm un incapable of being unjust? Right? And the argument is, I cannot be just if I'm afraid. So courage is the capacity. So it's not a thing. It's the capacity to know what to fear and what not to fear so that you do not waver when you're, you know, and you have a sound mind. But you can't be just if you're frightened, right? Because your being frightened will dictate how you respond. And you will not be able to have a completely sound mind. And therefore, they would say, if you if you are cowardly or you, because you are fearing the wrong thing, i.e., for example, you're fearing death or e.g. fearing death, you are no longer just because you are then subject to that. I would like to do the right thing by Paul, but I'm also fearful of my of my you know life. So if I lose my life, that's really important to me. It's not to say you made a logical mistake, by the way, if you said that because it's okay to be unjust to Paul because my life is valuable. So well, there, there you've lost the ability to reason. You've lost the only thing that you are capable of possessing, which is truly yours. So like when you're, I don't know if you've been angry recently with anybody, but the minute we are angry with them and we lose our capacity to reason, we've given away the only thing that we had from the Stoic perspective. It's like, so when I'm now frustrated, I'm like, I, I, even if I, you know, dislike the person in that moment, even if I love them for my entire life, I dislike them in that moment, I say to myself, no, 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 this is not worth, worth losing my mind over. My mind is the only thing of value. And that's been really, really helpful. Oh, I'm really frustrated about like, I don't know, taking this flow test for the pandemic and I'm really frustrated. No, it's not worth losing my mind over. My mind is the only thing of value. It's the only thing that I can, can control. Nobody else can take that from me. Even in the most dire situation where my body is harmed, I can still respond how I want to unless I choose, you know, choose to let go of that so i think that's a very powerful thing in the pandemic and mine's very minor like this is a minor inconvenience of having to take flow tests to stay vaccinated but other people have really really struggled so hepatitis will say you know you may fetter my leg but you all you're doing is you're fettering my leg you're not actually disrupting my character so even if you cut my head off all you've done is remove my poor head from its poor body you still haven't you still haven't um destroyed my character the only thing that's worth having so it's a very sort of stoic perspective what did the Stoics believe about luck? That's a very good question. So luck is something that happens through you. We tend to think of luck happening to us. And we tend, tend to, we tend to like, in the modern sense, we tend to go from one extreme to the other. Like, oh, this is all up to me and I deserve everything that I have. And I, you know, I should be rewarded with tax breaks for being so good with my money, right? Very sort of luck kind of view about how well I could be my money or it's so terrible it's not my fault nothing's my fault how dare such and such a person do this to me 
and how how dare this be so unreasonable and if i had been born early and if i'd done this and basically you just blame everything so we go from it's everything's my fault to <laughs> nothing and the stoics will say well luck happens through you so you've got preparation right we you and you know particularly paul that you were very prepared in a certain point in your life which meant when an opportunity came across to be able to uh, share the knowledge you brought into the world um, you were able to do so you were able to pivot very quickly you you were prepared and the opportunity came and you were able to work with that and that's that's part of you being an entrepreneur that's exactly one entrepreneur a successful entrepreneur does so there isn't there is preparation so a lot of people will say oh he was paul was really lucky to be able to sell that product or do this and you say well you didn't see me for the last three years putting myself in a position to be able to sell that product if i hadn't worked night and day which you by the way didn't see you only saw the end result then you wouldn't think i was lucky you would think i was really unlucky sometimes because i spent some really miserable you know fridays while you were out sitting on my computer working through the software right so people oh. think that you were lucky they'll say things like that you know as a and that's what people say to me. They say, oh, your timing was perfect. You sold the company. Your timing was perfect. I go, yeah, well, I guess so. But it didn't seem so perfect the 13 years I wasn't getting paid. And I was <laughs> having nightmares about bankruptcy while I was building it. But anyway. That's the kind of thing that Stokes will, will say, yes, there's, of course there's luck as well. For example, you might not have, you know, 13 years back, you might not quite have had the money to buy a Macintosh. And if you had never been able to buy a Macintosh, you would never have been able to do it. And that might just be luck. You might have been like, I just didn't have the money. I just didn't have it because I wasn't, you know, my family wasn't able to lend it to me. And I worked really hard. So sometimes you have a situation, for example, imagine you and I have to run a race to Los Angeles. You're likely to win because you're a lot nearer. And if I, if I arrive five minutes later than you, I've actually, I've actually worked harder because I've had to run from near London, right? You've had to run from Oregon, so and you should running, get there quicker. Yeah, running across the, the ocean is hard. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'd have to row across, and that's true. <laughs> and then people would say, but Paul is a better worker. If they don't think about the effort, they'll say, He's, he got here first. He must be better. They had, don't always take into consideration the trajectory that I had to run, which is also that there are elements of luck. So yeah. it's, it happens through you, not to you. Know, I, found I think that's very helpful. I found it interesting the way you point out in the book that Stoics hold that financial wealth, bodily health, geographical location, and social status are simply non-factors in the journey towards eudaimonia. Did I say it right? Eudaimonia. Yes. Well, you said you you can say it anyway. Leo says it the way you said it before. So you, basically, whenever you speak to someone, you can tell where they're from because if the Americans say it a certain way. We say it a different way. Brazilians say it a different way. Asians say it a different way. And I think that's wonderful, actually, that you get. And the Greeks say it correctly. <laughs> so, so yeah, we were like, what did the Greeks say? Well, you so know, you also fun. say we have an obligation to live in harmony with the natural world, and that seems to dovetail with your work in environmental uh, sustainability. So there was kind of a fit there. Stoicism was kind of a, a fit for you. I, I think I think there is. And also we, we worked it, right? It's the same kind of thing. Like it was a fit, just going back to the Macintosh. It was a fit for you because you happened to have a Macintosh, right? It was a fit for you because you happened to know the Macintosh at that particular time quite well. You were maybe a little bit on the vanguard, but also you had to put in the work. You had to, you had to think about how to make it work for yourself. So well, I would say uh, the same thing know, happened to you. Yeah. I mean... I had been doing direct marketing with mail for years. And so when the internet came along with email and web pages, that was like a wet dream for a direct marketing person. But I had put in 15 years of apprenticeship long before that, not realizing, not having, you know, this, this in all encompassing vision, but anyway, yeah, enough. Uh, no, but I think it's very useful because people seem to think, for example, I think this is a very interesting point that you're helping me make, is that people seem to think that stories means like a philosophy is kind of over here, it's very theoretical, that it's not much of an application, and if it is, you have to kind of twist it. But this is a good example using uh, your professional life to say, look, these are the principles that you actually know to be true. The Stoics have been saying this for 2,000 years, but unfortunately, the self-help books of the 1980s and onwards have been saying something different, right? So I think actually your example is very helpful because an entrepreneur is always credited from the last leg of their journey and not the first, you know, two, three, four, five, 13 years that you've, you've worked. And then you can say, yes, well, luck happened through me. It's because I made, yes, I, I was lucky. I was born in America rather than say, I don't know, you were born in Zimbabwe. You could have had exactly the same vision. 
exactly the same Macintosh and you wouldn't have had the market for it, right? right? You wouldn't have been in the right place at the right time, so to speak. But there's also a part that you put yourself in the right place in the right time, right? You put yourself there, whether you did that knowingly or unknowingly is, is, is also part of the luck. Because if, if it was completely unknowing, that was just being lucky, right? So I think stoicism enables us to kind of recognize our successes and our failures, right? Because then we know that we're not responsible for all our success. And conversely, we're not responsible for all our failings. And that also extends to everybody. So that's what the Stoics kind of focused a lot on. They said, okay, if that's true for you, that's true for everybody else. So when instead of giving, say, Bill Gates a lot of credit for everything that he's done, say, well, yes, certainly there is credit where credit's due, but it's not like he's responsible for everything. Even in your company, Paul, I'm sure you had to have customers and you were grateful for the people that worked with you or your or clients, oh, okay. and they were educated by the, you know, by the state or a private school, and you didn't educate them and you didn't build the roads for them and you didn't build the lawyers that you know that helped build this take the servers you needed to do your job. So the stakes kind of said, okay, work out what you're responsible for and increase your agency because i think self-help books in general if you're not careful can actually reduce people's agency and make them dependent on well just wait for version you know part two and part three or book six and then you then you'd be achieving it so I, I tell this kind of joke that uh imagine paul you tell me you know pick up that toilet paper on the top shelf and i'm like paul how do you do it like just stand here kaya and lift your arms up and i'm like yeah i'm lifting my arms like just believe kaya just believe and i'm like um i believe and i'm not getting the toilet paper and you're like oh paul what do i have to do like, you just didn't you have to read my book again i'm like i've read it twice now and it works out that you're free you know you're three inches taller than me and all i need is a step ladder stoicism's like what do you know what do you need and if you need a step ladder go and get one <laughs> it's not that there's a one size fits all which is quite i'm an entrepreneur you would know that right oh yeah i mean everything everything that you're saying uh, makes total sense. I think it's interesting to look at my entrepreneurial history and the success that came out of it as a kind of a, a, a story of stoicism in action because I basically, it took a lot of courage to take the level of risks that I took, but it was in alignment with my heart. I wasn't even trying to make a lot of money. I was just trying to do something meaningful that was in alignment with my character and my interests. And I did it out of love. And so it's a uh, it's, you know, I, I guess you could call that virtue. But anyway, we are just about running out of time. I, and I want to know, is there, can you just give us one last piece of advice? Uh, oh, actually, I, we need to tell our, use, our listeners about your website, which is stoickai.com. Yes. S-T-O-I-C-K-A-I.com. And Kai, there's so much more we could explore and things that we want to talk with you about, but we've run out of time. And I just want to say thank you so much for writing this book, for educating me, and for allowing me to educate our audience. It's been a pleasure. It's been wonderful. It's gone really quickly. I enjoyed it. And uh, for those who may have tuned in to Pathways Late, this is your host, Paul O'Brien, author of Intuitive Intelligence, a book that shares the theme of Pathways, which is personal and cultural evolution. And don't worry, you can play and or share this interview whenever you want via the internet or as a free podcast, and I'll tell you how in a minute. Today, we've been visiting with Kai Whiting, author of Being Better, Stoicism for a World Worth Living In. And I wanna say thank you to all of our listeners for tuning into Pathways which is broadcast and streamed on the internet at www.kboo.fm every other Sunday morning at 8.30 USA Pacific time. Even better, podcasts of today's show, which you can listen to and forward to others, are available for free at divination.com, spelled D-I-V-I nation.com, as well as via YouTube, iTunes, and other free podcast servers. This is Paul O'Brien reminding you to tell your friends about Pathways Radio and Podcast. And thanks again to Kai Whiting and to all of you listeners for tuning in and being a part of the Pathways Conversation.